Good morning, church. We are few, but we are mighty. It, uh, good morning and welcome uh, that we, uh, on this, uh, the first Sunday of August, might come to worship God. And so welcome all that you have brought, all that is a part of your world, all the joys and all of the worries, and lay them down here. Come to the place that God has set for you, and come and feast on the love and the understanding that God provides. So welcome. Good morning. My name is Reverend Andy Stinson. I am the pastor here. If you are visiting with us, please fill out a card in the back. Um, our table this morning is open to all. That uh, I have a few announcements this morning. That uh, first is, um, if, if you uh, our newsletter this month is uh, digital only, so you should have seen that in your email inbox. But if you didn't, uh, please feel free. There are there are hard copies in the back. Um, there are two event, there are two events that are ha- both happening the same day on the 13th of August. That to to let you know next Saturday. Uh, the first one is um, the uh, the Massachusetts Association of Churches Council of Churches are having a picnic in Taunton. So um, if you would like to go, um, it's open to all to to, uh, to all. All folks within the MACCC um, and all the other churches, if you're interested, um, there's information in the newsletter that's in the back. Um, also, um, and the, at the Hanson Church, also on the same day, is a, a Heart of Reconciliation retreat. Um, this comes out of the work of a guy by the name of Reverend Dr. Art Rauner. Um, he, uh, he was a, an incredible stellar figure. Um, for many years, he was pastor of Edina Congregational Church out in Edina, Minnesota. Um, but he uh, spent uh, the better part of his, his ministry um, doing uh, conflict reconciliation around the world. He went to, uh, to some of the most broken and conflict-ridden places on the planet. Uh, uh, um, during the time of apartheid, he went to South Africa and did reconciliation work between uh, the, between white and black people um, uh, uh, in that country. He is he has he was uh, he he was an amazing. Uh, figure and his legacy and his work is being carried on by his granddaughter, um, and she uh, has taken up the mantle of his work and also um, the mantle of his style of uh, and and wisdom. And so uh, uh, there will also be a gathering uh, on uh, with her and uh, on the work of reconciliation. Um, it, that is just. Powerful work. So if you're interested in either one of those, um, there are links and information in the newsletter that is in the back um, or in your inbox, and um, uh, as well as other things that are happening within the church, which I encourage you uh, to uh, check out. So uh, it, uh, it is high summer, and uh, with it, we have the chance to, uh, uh, to, to be church, to... to to relax, to take a breath in this hour as it's just too hot to do too much. It's just too, it, it, it is that, the, that the, the steam and the heat of the day actually have a lesson for us that we can relax into the Lord. And so let us this morning as we come to worship, give our cares Give ourselves, give all of our work and our labor and our effort over to God who made us. Come, let us worship.
Join me in our call to worship this morning that you'll find in your bulletin. Come and worship. For the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please rise and let's sing together our first hymn. It is hymn number seven. Praise the Lord Almighty. Join me in the unison prayer of invocation and the Lord's Prayer that you'll find in your bulletin. Strengthen us, O God, by your word and spirit, that by your light we take up the power of your holy supper, in which we may not falter, and in your will be ready to live fully. Come to us this day, as we pray, as you have taught us, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. We come now to our time of prayer. What prayers would we lift up today? What is it that God has called and laid upon our hearts to lift up to the world? Other prayers this morning? The homeless. We will pray for John Paul's healing for sure. Other prayers this morning? Pray for those in recovery. Thank you. We pray for the Fernandes family who's feeling under the weather today as well. To continue to, yeah. We'll continue to pray for Jane. Thank you. Other prayers this morning. Lord, there is so much that we are carrying in this world in these days. The, the anxiety of our, of our livings, the, the, the comings and the goings, the uncertainty of it all, the violence of the world, all of it that seems to press in on us, that calls us to be yours, that calls us to be your faithful stewards of the time and the talent and the energy you've given us, that calls us to fight for that which is good and right and true, which calls us to be ready. Not just ready for all the the bad things that may come our way, but to be ready for for the good, to be ready for the blessings that you would lay out for us, to be ready for the wonders of what it is to feast at your table, to know it in smile and joy and laughter, in love and connection, to know it in ways that we, we never imagined it could find us and that we might be ready with open hands to receive your grace for us. And so on this morning we pray. We pray for John Paul that he may be healed and well and good and be the, the light that he is in this world. Lay your hand on him and, and uh, restore him to wholeness. Lord, we ask for prayers for J.J. that in this time he may see 
and come to know you better in all the different ways that he might encounter you and that in that he may make the make choices towards his health and towards his towards the reception of your grace in his life Lord, we ask for a continued healing for Jane and for uh, that, uh, your, that you might be with her and you might surround her in these days. Lord, for, for prayers for Larry, that as he goes forward uh, in this week, that uh, all those who will care for him might care for him well and good so that he may be whole upon the earth. Lord, we ask for prayers for Greg's family, that as they, uh, as they are in grief and in loss, that your love and your peace might surround them. We ask for, for prayers of grace and healing for the Fernandes family. And we ask for, for your love and your guidance for all of those who are in recovery, that they may know your angels that stand among them and they may be bolstered in strength by your spirit. We, ask, we, are, we rejoice in the, in the birthdays of Audrey's daughters and, that, and all, the, all the goodness that they've brought to this world. Uh, let them know blessing in these days. And Lord, we ask for prayers of joy and peace for Aunt Meryl and for all, of the, for all those who have loved her in this world, that she may know your goodness and grace and love. And for those without a home in this world, surround them with your grace that the homeless may know home and place in you. Lord, there are so many prayers that are in our hearts and in our minds that we carry in this moment. We lift them up to you in this moment of silence. And all this, O Lord, and the prayers that we said aloud and the prayers that are in the, the silent moments of the night and the prayers that dwell in our hearts and in all that you have given us. Let us turn to you in thanksgiving, turn to you in hope, turn to you that we may be ready to receive all that you have for us in blessing and goodness. We pray this, O Lord, in your name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's rise and sing together our next hymn. It is Come Thou Almighty King, number 247.
Please be seated. The Hebrew Scripture lesson comes from the first chapter of the book of Isaiah. This is the center of the Bible, and it, and it in many ways, is a, it's one of the greatest gear shifts, one of the great changes of what we find in God's voice with the people of Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and and calling of convocation. I can't endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. And when you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove your evil deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn what is good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us, let's argue it out, says the Lord. If your sins are like scarlet, will they become like snow? If they are red like crimson, will they become like wool? If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And from the 12th chapter of Luke comes the lesson from the gospel. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give alms, make purses for yourself that do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near, no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there is your heart also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat. He will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so... Blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall. I was a a chaplain in Iraq. Many of you know that. I spent time, uh, about a year of my life, and throughout the battle space of Iraq in 2011. And whenever you went out, went anywhere there, you know, you you lived kind of on the base, and that was fairly luxurious where where I, I was blessed to be. But there was, whenever you traveled anywhere, there was a way in which you had to get your, you had to get your gear on. You had to get ready for action. It, whether, no matter how you traveled, whether you traveled by ground or, or in, a, in a truck or you traveled by air, 
there were certain things that you carried with you. There were certain things you brought. One is you, had a, you always had a helmet, and you always had body armor on. You, well, actually, uh, you know, because, you know, I was me and doing what I was doing, I actually had a little uh, transponder gitchy, which I don't really know what they're called. But if something bad happens, I knew to turn it on. And that, that basically anybody anywhere would be, would, that was in the, the, our area would be able to find me if something bad happened in our travels. So I kind of always made sure that was with me as well. Uh, that... Uh, well, I, I was not a combatant. I was a chaplain, so I didn't carry a weapon, but I, also, I would carry my communion kit everywhere that I went so that uh, should the opportunity arise that there were soldiers who wanted to take communion, that was available to them. And there were other things that I carried as well. But there was this ritual, this way of which you just geared up that you would put on and get ready for action, even though there was no expectation necessarily that maybe you were going to get hurt, or maybe you were, but you, 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 there was always this way in which you got ready for action. Today's gospel has this little line in it where it, you know, which it, it says, be dressed for action, which is a great line, and it's a beautiful translation. It's just wrong. Uh, that's the that's a problem with it is when we try to modernize things because what it actually says is gird your loins, okay? Like and and you know the tw- so and so the twelve year old boy in me cannot uh, cannot uh, uh, put aside the opportunity to preach on girding your loins, <laughs> like you know it's because we, we and I mean it's a phrase you've all heard it right like it's a it's a phrase you've heard somewhere out there like this notion that we should gird our loins. And what does that mean? Well, today, it's, what it is, is about getting ready for action. And, and while, and there's actually, on the front of your bulletin, there's a nice little diagram about how that happens. But, but you don't have to look at that right now, because I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and show you how this actually happens. You see, in the ancient world, people wore tunics. Both men and women actually wore tunics. This, they are not dissimilar to the robe in which I'm wearing right now. Now, the, the problem with this, and many of you who've been here before will attest that sometimes you trip on your tunic. Uh, I, I've tripped going up these stairs I don't know how many times, and, and because there's this notion where sometimes you, can't, you can't get caught on things. And so the notion, if you're going to do hard work, or particularly if you're getting ready for combat, you, the, the command was always to gird your loins. Get ready for it. Get dressed accordingly. Now, this has, I think it has a beautiful, this is a, this is a you know, just something they did back in the day. But I, would, I will submit to you, and I hope by the time we're done, you're with me as well, that this actually has within it and a part of it a wider significance, a deeper significance. That actually, when we talk about this notion of girding our loins, we're not, talk, we're not just kind of making this kind of silly 12-year-old humor joke, but we are, or we're reaching back to something anachronistic or something old and musty, but we're actually... It's actually a real tool that we can hold up when we find ourselves afflicted. And friends, I don't know about you, but I find myself afflicted about three times a day these days. I find myself having to do a little bit of spiritual combat. Now, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about combat in the streets. I'm not talking about wrestling somebody down. I'm, not talking about, I'm talking about what happens in my heart. I'm talking about what happens when I watch a news story or what happens when somebody tells me about a, a tragedy in their life or, or something that happened when a tragedy strikes me. And, and, and my understanding is wobbled and my heart is, heart is broken. That when we get in those moments that, and that, that Jesus' invitation to us to be ready for action, to be to gird our loins when we find ourselves in these moments. Because the thing about this story is it, that Jesus is talking about this parable. The, the biggest thing we have to remember about it to begin with is it begins at night. This is cast at night. This is waiting for the master to return at night. Friends, I don't know about you, but I find myself in darkness 
on occasion these days more often than not, that when the darkness comes creeping around, how then are we to be? And his and Jesus' instruction to us is gird your loins. And so I want to talk through this. I've got a few things I want to tell you about what it means to actually gird your loins. So the first thing you do, yeah, I'm really going to do it. Uh, so the first thing you do is you actually grab the grab your tunic and you pull it up and you hold it in front of you. You hold it in front of you. See, because the, the, the idea is that's the stuff you're going to get tripped up on. Think about this in your life. The things that you're going to, you know, you're going to get tripped up on. Maybe you're, maybe you, maybe you carry, maybe you carry some fear or some anxiety and you know that your anxiety, if you let it get going, it's going to, it's going to get away from you. Maybe you have some, some, uh, some, some worry. Maybe you have some anger. Maybe you have some depression. And you know if that thing gets away from you, it's gonna trip your feet up. It's gonna, fe- it's gonna trip you up. And, and you're gonna, and when we fall down on the spiritual battlefield, it is not a pretty sight. And so the first task is to, is to gather it up and hold it in front of us. To look at the things in our life that might trip us up. Take inventory. Uh, you know, we are always wanting, we are always wanting to just ignore those things, aren't we? Like we just want to push them away. We just want to like, oh, that, don't worry about that. That's not a thing. We don't have to worry. Like, I'm, you know, I'm just not going to be angry. I'm just not going to be worried. I'm just not going to be uh, those things. And yet they still find us. The invitation is not to push them away. The invitation is to gird your loins and keep your lamp lit. Take a look at it and have the faith that Christ Jesus can and will overcome the things that you hold up that are too, that are scary or that might trip you up in the course of your day in your life. Look at the thing, look at the tripping hazards in your world. Because, friends, they are real. And that our desire to just kind of ignore them down there and just pretend that they're not going to get us and nothing bad's going to happen is actually what gets us into trouble. So the first thing is to, pre- is to prevent our tangling up and tripping by looking at what we've got. The second thing we get out of this is that it increases our range of motion, Right? Like I can now move my legs in my and in, in ways that I couldn't move them before. That I have the opportunity of I can I can move and I can I can run when maybe I could not run before, and without tripping or falling. The second great gift out of out of the the work of girding our loins is that we begin we are able to respond to God's Spirit faster and quicker. When we bring in our anxieties, when we bring in the things that are going to sabotage us, when we bring, in, bring them in rather, and hold them up and look at them rather than push them away, we all of a sudden get a whole greater range of movement. And that the great call of this, of girding our loins, is to be able to step into greater relationship, greater love, greater peace, greater joy with Christ Jesus and the one who made us. Like, be able to step into that. To be able to run to this table. Not to walk, not to shuffle nicely, not to cross our legs in the appropriate way, but to run to this table when we need it. To run to God's grace and God's love for us when we need it. And so, we pick, these, we pick up and look at those things. And then the next thing we do is put them behind us. So, in the ancient world, there would be a, you, you would wear a great belt. That they were known for their belts, actually. They, you would have a six foot, six inch belt that would go around, and you would, and often you would either, you could either tie it in the back or let the, the excess flow in the back, but you would put it behind you. This notion of being, of not only being able to, to now to have more range of motion, but to, cons, but to earnestly Put behind us the things that would trip us up. To put behind us the things that would trip us up. We, we see this throughout the Gospels. You see it again and again. 
What is, what is when Peter comes to Jesus and he says, you know, uh, you know, he says, uh, Lord, you know, make me great. He says, get behind me, Satan. He says it to Peter, the guy he founds the church on. But he said, but anything that gets in the way that might trip up who God is, who is, who, who God is going to be in the world, but also who God is calling you to be in the world. The thing that trips us up, put it behind us in a real and powerful and deliberate way. Don't that call on God to say to put this thing back and to buckle it down. But it's often called the girdle of faith is what we talk about it. This this big belt. Big belts are called girdles in the Bible. I mean, they have all sorts of fun words and that these big belts, we can buckle it down. We can use our faith as a way of actually putting it in its place. The things that would break us, the things that would lose us. The other thing that is a question is, if you see a guy dressed like this, it says something about him. Right? Like, if you see a guy who's doing this, it says something about him. You know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a child of the 80s. And it's like, and I, you know, for, for those of you who, who lived through that, God bless you. You know, but, but I, I remember going to school and, 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 uh, you know, if you went to school in the 80s, there was always the, the kids who were really ready to go that came into the classroom in September. They showed up with their trapper keeper. Anybody remember a trapper keeper? Who, who remembers a trapper keeper? I see. I, yeah, like, right. Like, they, they'd be this big, ginormous folder that you could probably use as a life raft if you had to on a bad day. And it would open up and they had all their things and they had all their little places and all their class. I was not the kid with the trapper keeper, by the way. I just want you to know that. But that, that you would, and, but if you showed up, if you were the kid that showed up with a trapper keeper, it said something about you, right? Like you were a kid who's ready to learn. You're ready to go. You're like, all right, like bring me, give me some handouts because I got some folders to fill up with them. If you were in the ancient world and you saw a guy with his loins girded, you knew he was, he, he was ready for action. Whether it was action in combat or whether it was just act, whether it was just hard work. It didn't necessarily have to be fighting anything. It was just hard work, but it said something about him. Just in the way that trapper keeper said something about the kids that came in to the classroom. There's this way in which that it, the ability to, to that the, the ability for us to declare to not just other people. I mean, other people are great to declare that we're ready to go, but to really declare to God that we're willing to step into the fight, that we're willing to take on the the. The, the devils that are in our midst. We are willing to unsheath our sword against the dragons of our days. That we are willing to do the heavy lifting and the hard work. One of the most, I, I, I've said this, I've, I've said this before, but it, it bears repeating. That when I was in seminary, I, you know, I, I spent, you know, it's a three-year program. I jammed it into four. Um, and uh, that, uh, that, and and so through my seminary program, uh, I learned all kinds of great stuff. I, I got, you know, I, I would learned about Bible. I learned about languages. Well, I didn't learn much about languages, but I learned about Bible. I learned about pastoral care. I learned about all kinds of things. But that was not what was what what became actu- what I realized uh, some years later was actually the powerful thing about me committing myself to go to seminary. What actually was the powerful thing was I showed up in the call that God had for me and 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 God said and I said to God, "Okay, rearrange my internal furniture." And God took me seriously on that. That God that God not just made me better, not just improved me, but made me different, made me other than I actually was, that actually transformed me into the very person that God had built me, to, that God had built me and God was building me to be. That our showing, our willingness to show up, our willingness to go through the process of looking at the stuff that might, tri- that might trip us up and then actively seeking to put it behind us and then buckling it down with our faith actually opens in us and declares to us, not just to the world, not just to our fellow pilgrims, not just to the people around us, but declares to God that we're ready to go to game. We're ready for the fight. 
Even if we're not. Even if we're not. I can tell you, every soldier that went outside the wire, with, that either with me or wherever, when I was in Iraq, they were not all of them ready to go every time they went. And yet they went because that's the place that they were called to serve and to be. So too is it with our spiritual lives. That when, that, that God, that, that when we open ourselves to the Lord, the Lord takes us seriously at that. And that's what the beauty of this table is, that there's a place set for you in it. You're not alone in it. You're not abandoned in it. You're not broken in it. You're not crawling your way across broken glass to this place of abundance. But, there, but God is actively in the fight working to set a place for you. The greatest line of all of that scripture is simply that your, the, your Father in Heaven wants to give you all good gifts. All good gifts. And the work of us, us girding our loins is just a, a small little piece of what we can do in the middle of that great adventure. Of us opening our hands so that we can't, rather than, rather than keeping them clenched. Us clearing ourselves ready to move towards God. Us clearing our space ready to step into the fight. Because this is the thing about that Isaiah text. This, this text gets ignored all the time. But it's actually, I think, one of the most significant pieces of, te- of, of Scripture in the Old Testament. Because what happens in the first chapter of Isaiah, which is which everything changes. You see, what used to happen, what used to happen was the, the Israelites would go out and God would say, do this. And they would like be like, uh, okay, sorta. And they might be good for a little while, but then they'd get off the, you know, they'd go and, you know, and the Israelites were really good. Like they'd cross the white line, cross the rumble strip into the breakdown lane. You know, I mean, they would really get off into the weeds. They were not, they were no amateurs, the Israelites. They would get themselves into serious existential trouble in the course of their lives. And in the court, and God, and the way in which they kind of got back onto the road was through this system of sacrifices. Okay, you've, you've made a mistake, you've screwed up, do some work, and then come back to me. Like, you know, sacrifice some bulls, sacrifice, do, do some sacrifices, and then we'll come back into relationship as a way of kind of them finding their, redirecting their energies and finding their way, their, their way straight back. But here in the first chapter of Isaiah, and that system has gone on for a thousand years. I mean, it's gone on for as long as anybody can remember. That's how they got out of trouble, was they worked really hard, and they got themselves out of trouble. What happens in in Isaiah is this foretaste of what we find, what we're about to find fulfilled in Christ Jesus, which is, your sacrifices are no longer sweet to me. All that, all that sacrificing, all that work that you're doing, don't worry about it. Stop it. In fact, it's getting in the way. Stop it. Stop doing all that. All I'm asking for you is to, is to, to, is to turn your heart towards the good, towards your heart, towards the, towards the right. Try, try in some basic way to live out the, the call that I have for you in this world. Whether, when, you know, when it says this, this uh, tending the widows and the orphans. That's, that's a kind of a code for the, the work that God has for the people of Israel and the work that God has for you and me. Like, stop thinking you're going to earn your way into it because I'm done with earning. Now, says Jesus, I no longer call you slave, but I call you friend. I set a place at my table for you. I'm ready to feed you. I'm ready to strengthen you. I'm ready to give you all that you need in order to have all the good gifts of heaven. To have them all. And this invitation for us to gird our loins is not a way for us to earn our way into the kingdom. It's quite the opposite. It's a way to put us in a position where we can open our hands, where we can stop messing with our skirt and actually be able to receive the grace and the goodness and the, and the joy that God has for us. That we can run, not walk to the table 
of abundance and to the joy that's in that's possible in life. This is what God calls us to do when we gird our loins is to get in that place where where Christ Jesus can feed us. Our table is open to all who would receive it. Uh, Let us sing together our communion hymn. Um, This is a very simple hymn. It's kind of more of a chant. So we're going to sing it four or five times and uh, and, uh, as we prepare the table. Let's sing together. Jesus, remember me. Number 214. Please be seated. Those words, Jesus, remember me when you come into into your kingdom, were said by the thief on the cross that was on the cross with Christ, that was uh, that that uh, there dying for his crimes. The 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 thief looked to Christ, looked to the King, and said, "Remember me." We come to this table in remembrance of Christ. In our desire to be remembered. In our desire to, to remember. And, and when I say remember, this is not a cognitive test. It's not a, it's not a how many numbers after I say this set, set series of numbers do you remember. But it is to be reconnected. To be remembered. As if one who has lost a digit or a hand has it brought back in. As if one family who has lost a member for, uh, who has lost a, a family member for over a long time might come home to reunion. Like a party that is, that is, uh, that is dull without one person arrival that everyone awaits. Friends, that purpose, that person is you. And that place is here, and this table is set. And it was for this purpose that when it was evening, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. And he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. And so thus it is that the Son of Man is glorified, and in him God is glorified, that all who would receive it will have eternal life. So come, for all things are ready.
And Jesus said, the one who comes to me shall never hunger. Our trays contain both wine and juice. So the juice is the white, which is on the inside of the tray, and the wine is on the outside, which is on the outer ring on the outside of the tray. So come, let us gather at the table, for all is ready. When it was evening, Jesus took the cup, and he had given thanks. He said, This is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we are ever thankful for the strengthening of your table, for the fact that you set a place for us, that not just at this table, but in this world, that that you have strength in abundance to give to us in all the fights of our world and all of the heavy lifting that we are called to do. Let this meal gird up our loins. Let this meal open our hearts to the grace and the peace and the love that you have for us. Let this meal... Give us the ability to run towards your kingdom and your love in all that we do. We pray this, O Lord, in your name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue our worship by our time of offering. It is our tradition that we offer, we put our offering in the offering boxes in the back. Um, and they'll be presented shortly. But if, if you're visiting with us, I encourage you uh, not to leave a, a, an offering, but to simply fill out a card uh, in, the, in the back so that we might be able to keep in touch with you and uh, be able to uh, let you know more about what's happening here at First Congregational Church. With that, let us offer our gifts to God. 
Let us offer all that we've been, we've been given. Let, let us simply give our gifts just a bit, just a, a, a moment, and that in it we might be in true right relationship with the one who made us by offering back some of that which God has given us. Come, let us offer our gifts to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh Lord, let these gifts go forward. And let them bring light to the darkness of the world. Let them bring joy to those in despair. Let them do your work and help to build your kingdom in this world. We pray this, O Lord, in your name. Amen.
Go forward this day and gird your loins. Go forward this day and know God's love and God's grace is upon you. Go forward this day and fear not that which is before you. For God's grace and God's hope and God's love goes with you. Go forward and spread it about the earth. Amen.